verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. Okay. I want to put in Genesis 1.31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And the reason I threw that in there is because repent in verse 6 and verse 7 is a change of mind. It's not that God sinned by creating man. It's a changed mind. He's like, at first, everything was good. Everything was going great. Then Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, then you have uh, Cain and Abel we talked about. Abel did right in God's eyes. Things were good. Cain didn't. And it got so bad that God changed his mind. It went from him thinking that creating man was a good thing, that it was a bad thing. But, now we get to verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'm one of those people I believe in dispensational teachings because the Bible teaches it. God always dispenses grace in every dispensation. He just doesn't do it the same way in every dispensation. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect, perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. Another thing I'll link in the bottom is a brother, I don't know if I can or not, um, I'll see, but a brother did a teaching on that can a Christian be perfect in the eyes of the Lord, something along that line, and he went through and talked about having a perfect heart. I did a teaching recently about having iniquity in your heart. Lost people hold iniquity in their heart. God won't listen to them. But when they throw that iniquity at the feet of God, God will listen to them. And their heart's perfect because every time they fall into sin and temptation, they take that iniquity and throw it at the foot of the cross. They fall on their knees and they repent. You can have a perfect heart with the Lord. Your heart can be perfect. So, Noah was perfect in his generations. And I always look at this saying, I mean, look around you, Noah. Look at all the sinful fleshly pleasures. Look at all the giants, mighty men, men of renown. Now I, I went ahead and looked up renown because I wanted to. Renown, uh, fame, celebrity, exalted reputation derived from the extensive praise of great achievements or accomplishments. And praise of men, you know, not of God, but of men. And I'm like, did you not want to want renown, Noah? Didn't you want to be renowned among the people? No, he wanted to be renowned with God. He wanted God to know him, and he wanted God to um, be his reputation, that he obeys God and follows God. Okay? He wanted the praise of God, not of men, and his achievements to be worth something in God's eyes, not the world's eyes. Did it take courage to stand against all that was going on? We're coming back to the habitation of a Christian versus the habitation of a lost world. Did it take great courage for Noah to say, I don't want nothing to do with it. I want my heart to be right with the Lord. And I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent. People get on to me when I say, someone can claim to have repented, and someone can claim that they believe in Jesus Christ, and it's up here. Someone said that you can miss heaven by 13 inches. It's all up here. They still justify sin, a sign of a mar uh, the mark of a false convert, the sign of someone who's not saved. They justify sin. They can be wrong and proven wrong with Scripture, and they get convicted and say, you know what, you're right, I'm giving this up. But you have people that hold on to their sin, no matter how much Scripture you quote to them, they hold on to their sin and they justify sin. But they're holding the iniquity in their heart. Noah didn't want nothing to do with that. He wanted to have his heart right with the Lord. When you repent, that's why I keep pushing people. They start talking about repentance. Repentance is just a change of mind. Uh, I always tell them, you do realize that the lost world believes they're sinners. I've come across a lot of lost people that say, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. So what? I'm going to live life my way. I don't care. Did they? Is that repentance? They admitted they're sinners. No. 
The key in repentance is having sorrow for sinning against God. Why is the sorrow so important? Because with the sorrow, it happens here. Just admitting you're a sinner happens here. You miss heaven by 13 inches. Sorrow's got to be there. Repentance is part of salvation. Sorrow for sinning against God. Okay? Noah wanted his heart to be perfect with the Lord. He wasn't going to give in. It took a lot of courage. And today, brothers and sisters in Christ, those of you who, have, who stand, stand, stand for the Word of God, who stand for absolute truth, you have great courage. And I am not patting you on the back per se, but I am encouraging you to continue to have great courage. I am lifting you up that you're doing right to have that courage and not give in. Mm -hmm. So many people are making excuses to leave their habitation. Bible-believing Christians, when I talk about the great falling away, they're using all kinds of justifications to leave their first habitation as a Christian. Lost person, that man is dead. It's, that's no, that wasn't your first habitation anymore because that man is dead. The old man is dead. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Your habitation of a Christian is the Word of God, prayer, and among brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay. And a lot of people sometimes, that I believe the great falling away, they try to grab and try to reclaim that old man. They try to resurrect the old man and they can't do it. Their life is just miserable and horrible. Verse 10 and Noah began, th began, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Sodomy. People try to make it out where that's not a big issue. It's just you know violence and stealing and you know cussing and alcoholics and drug you know all this stuff. But they have tried to avoid the fact that. Right here, for all flesh had corrupted his ways upon the earth. Sodomy was a big thing going on. Okay. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them which I will destroy them with the earth. Now what can we relate this to? And I'm not going to go into big studies, uh, but isn't this just sounds a lot like the time of Jacob's trouble? Uh, and I already quoted the verse that is in the Noah's day. Noah's uh, Greek to English. Noah is Hebrew to English. Uh, Noah's day was, so shall today be. And it's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. It won't be a flood of water that God's destroying the world with. He's going to be pouring out his wrath on the earth and destroying it with fire. Okay. 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of, the, of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shall you set in the side thereof, with, with lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. Okay. I'll put a space there because <laughs> if you ever go through, and sometimes it's worth it, if you ever go through um, how the, the tabernacle, uh, the temple was built, the Ark of the Covenant, everything had to be precision and be precise. Okay? And I know this is going off a little bit, but you look at your body, your body is the temple for the Holy Ghost. How intricate and detailed is your body? Everything is made in the perfect way so your whole body functions the way it's supposed to. Everything is detailed. Everything was set up, Moses is supposed to make it this way. And as we get further down, we'll find out how old Moses was when God commanded him to do all this stuff. 17, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in earth shall die. 
But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Okay. And I wanted to make a side note. Uh, I think the movie was Noah. Don't go see it. Don't go see movies anymore about the Bible. They're trying to put out these movies saying, this is about the Bible, and they try to do the story of the Bible, and they always corrupt the Word of God. They're always corrupting the Word of God. Okay. Uh, biggest thing is, uh, in that movie, Noah, don't watch it, um, Noah's kids didn't have wives. Um, another, some man broke in onto the ark and got onto the ark. So when the Bible says only Noah and his wife and his sons and his wives were the only ones on the ark, the Bible lied. The Bible lied. Uh, some guy snuck onto the ark. I mean, it was just so wicked and satanic, and people went and watched it. And I had a professing Christian that I went and saw that movie with, and, oh yeah, that was kind of wicked, but... You know, oh well. She did. She wasn't appalled by what they were doing in that movie. I should have walked out. Uh, but I was newly saved, and I was one of those people that I'll still stick through it. Um, I've watched movies that even newly saved because I was addicted to movies that I should have walked out of, and I didn't. So, don't go see movies, okay, on the Bible. You can see documentaries, uh, people like movies talking about people's lives, uh, Christians' lives in the past. But don't, don't, don't go to movies and get your head messed up because they're always going to go th against this book every time. Okay, I had to, <laughs> it started getting really hot so I had to get the sweater off and I realized the sun had changed so I moved stuff around. But we left off on verse 19. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Uh, verse 20. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after their kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Okay. Now, I was kind of getting into it. I'll do it a little bit. People try to grab there the two by two and try to make a love story out of it. Bottom line, you had to have male and female animals, two by two, to reprocreate the earth. That's the main purpose here. God is saving animals to repopulate the earth with those animals. He's going to destroy the world. But because he, Noah found grace, he's not going to just lift them up, throw it down, and throw them out there. There's nothing left. No food, no animals, no nothing. Okay. At this point, you can imagine Noah thinking, okay, wow, this is a great undertaking on me and my sons and my wife and my sons' wives, that God is really mad at mankind. Did Noah falter or faint? Okay. He's being commanded to do all this stuff, and I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead a little bit. Moses is 600 years old when the flood happened. And even back then, 600 years was getting up there in age. Okay, Some of them lived to be 800 um, to 900. He was past middle age. He was getting up there in age. Okay, But did he faint and falter? God's mad at the world. Um, he's asking me to do all these things. It's a great physical task. Um, Verse 22, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Yeah, he did it. He obeyed God and did it. He had courage. And I want to encourage the brethren. There's some people saying, I want to do something for the Lord. I feel like I want to do something for the Lord. Uh, when God's telling you, go hand out that gospel tract, try your best to have courage. All you have to do is walk up and say, excuse me, sir, ma'am, can I give you this? And I've had a lot of people say, no, I don't want it. That shouldn't discourage you because they say, no, they don't want it. Okay? You hand it to them and, and they say, no, they don't want it. They don't want it. You keep it and you wait for the next person. And if you fail to do it, brothers and sisters in Christ, yes, you need to kick yourself in the butt. I'm being serious. You need to kick yourself in the butt, not hard, saying, Lord, help me. You need to go back to prayer and say, Lord, help me have courage that the next person you tell me to, I'll have courage to do it. If you just, a lot of people say, oh, that's just okay, it's no big deal, it's, it's okay. 
No. Pray God for courage. Pray to God for courage. Don't beat yourself up. There's a difference between kicking yourself in the butt saying, oh my gosh, or smacking yourself upside the head spiritually saying, oh Lord, I'm so sorry. Help me have courage next time. And then there's a difference between beating yourself up and being totally distracted by it and just not being useful in any other way because you keep beating yourself up. But God is going to command us to do things in our lives and we're going to have to have courage uh, to stay in our first habitation, um, to clean up your life. God's going to command us and we need to have courage that God knows what he's doing. The Bible talks about giving God thanks in all things. When bad things happen to us, we give God thanks. And I'm always going to be like the brother in Christ that does this teaching. Um, to let people know that giving thanks to God in all things has to do with the lost world. How they treat you, bad things that happen in your life that you have no control over. Now, if you fall into sin, or you make a decision that's wrong, and bad things happen, that's on you. If you don't give God the thanks, you fall down on your knees and ask God to, to help you with that. Not repair, I'm trying to think of good words. Help save you through that. Help get you back to what's right. Repent, you get rid of the sin. If you make some bad financial decisions, you fall on your knees and say, Lord, I'm going to start doing right. Help me get out of this. If God wants you to go through it the long way, then you're going to go through it long. God finds a short way to get you out of it. God's the one that's going to save you out of that. When you make a mistake, you're not to use that. You're supposed to come to Him honestly saying, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. I won't make that bad financial decision. I won't make that choice again. And God will help you, but you don't give God thanks for bad things that happen to you when you're the one that's at fault. The thanks that, this, that I'm talking about is when the world does things to you that's out of your control or you don't deserve it, you didn't do anything wrong, and bad things are happening to you, God has a reason for it. But God will command you to do things and you don't always understand why. God will command you to do things and you understand perfectly well, but the flesh and the lost world and professing Christians are going to try to get you to leave your first habitation and say, no, you don't want to do things that way. You, you know, that some of those sins you have in your home, there's no big deal about it. It's not a big, people just make too big a deal about sin. Noah was courageous. God said he was angry with the world. For the passage I didn't put in here, it talks about how God is angry with the wicked every day. And he's bent his bow. He is um, someone with his sword, but has to do with sharpening his sword. He, whetstone. He has put his sword to the whetstone. You know, God was angry with the world, and he was mad. And I've talked to people, and this isn't a side note. The courage, Noah had courage, but I believe Noah also feared God. Part of having a perfect heart with the Lord is fearing God. People try to make out God's wrath to be something to love, and it's not. God's wrath is something to fear. Noah had faith and believed in God, but when God started talking about what he's going to do to the earth, Noah had to have some fear, knowing that that was something to be afraid of. Today, today, we tell people about the time of Jacob's trouble. It's something to be feared, and they don't fear it. We as Bible-believing Christians, we're not, we don't fear it because we're going to go through it. We're not going to go through it. But we fear it because we understand how dangerous it is. And because of our fear, we are testifying and motivating the lost world. You don't want to go through that. The Bible says, by the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It's a fearful thing to be chastened of the Lord. That's something to fear. You're not, to, you're not supposed to say, Lord, chasten me. I love your chastening, Lord. Just chasten me. No, you're to fear it first. After it happens, you're to thank God for it, for getting you back on the right track. And you praise the Lord and you give Him thanks for chasing you. But your attitude before the chasing is you need to make the motivation to do right and obey God's words. You don't want His chastening on you. That and you love Him. Man, if a man love me, he will keep my words. You love the Lord. That's why most I tell people you fall into sin and temptation, repent. Repent and forsake that ASAP. ASAP. But a lot of you are being courageous out there, and I want to motivate you to continue to be courageous. And if you fail, uh, God's saying, hey, preach the gospel to this person. Uh, 
um, you read the Bible and you come across something you don't understand. Maybe God doesn't want you to understand it at that time. Um, be courageous. Understand that God has everything under control. If you lack courage, God will give you the courage. Moses had the courage, the perfect heart. He was right. He was perfect in God's in his generation. He trusted God. He was courageous. And also, I put down here. Make sure we're going to go to chapter uh, Genesis chapter six. Um, make sure that you're giving God the glory and everything. Now, one thing is, is you fall into sin again and bad things happen to you. You don't give God the glory for that. You give God the glory if you don't repent. You give God the glory for forgiving you. You repent and you forsake. You don't repent that and God chastens you. After the chastening, you give God the glory. You give God the thanks. Thank you, Lord, for getting me on the right path. It was you that did it, and I couldn't have done it without you. Okay, but you're to fear it before. So verse 1 of chapter 7. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast, get a hold of that one, thou shalt take to thee by sevens. The male, you're doing good, stay. The male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. And I had to make a side note. Notice here, God has already set up clean beasts that you can eat where there are seven of each and unclean beasts you know even before the laws are written he already had it set up there's clean beasts and there's not say verse 3 of fowls also of the air by sevens the male and the female to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth if you look into nature, you will find that oftentimes it's birds that causes seeds to travel great distances. You're like, why is this tree, it started out mainly in this area, and it went to another area. How did it get there? You know, it's birds. That's why there were seven of each of those. But seven of the um, clean bees is because they're for eating. They need to multiply faster so no one his wife can have food and his sons and their wives can have food and when they repopulate the earth. Number four, verse four, for yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Now I put down seven days <laughs> because Number of completion. Creation was done in seven days. In Revelations, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, you got seven years, seven trumpets, seven vials, seven seals. Okay. And part of me um, wants to say that Moses, can you, can you imagine Moses' heart get beating a little bit faster as they get closer and closer to this? Um, yes, he's not appointed to wrath. Yes, he's getting saved by God. But he's never seen it rain. There's no oceans. I love the ocean, but there's no oceans. Uh, he didn't even fathom. Couldn't even fathom all the waters of the deep breaking up. It was still a fearful thing. And as it got closer and closer, could you imagine his heart kind of beating a little bit faster? That not knowing what's truly going to happen. I mean, you know what's going to happen, but how it's going to happen? Truly understand. Stay. But Noah still believed God's word, and he stayed faithful. Now, Noah believed God's word, but did he really understand the magnitude of what God was going to do, power and wrath? I already said that, but yeah. Is your heart beating as a little faster as we see signs of pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ? Mine is. Uh, us being caught up. Catching away, the Bible says caught up. Okay. Mine does. But here's the thing. Mine doesn't beat faster or the anticipation is not out of fear, though. As a Christian, it's with excitement. We're getting closer and closer to being with our Lord and being with Him for all eternity. And I understand the Holy Spirit's in us, but I'm talking about physically being with Him for all eternity. 
and we understand that time period in God's wrath, and we fear that time period. And five, verse five, and Noah did according unto all, unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of the waters was upon the earth. And I jumped the gun because I just had to. Notice how old Noah was. Even back then, it was getting there. So, he was over middle age, and not everybody lived to be 809 years, 800 to 900 years old. Okay. And, um, the reason I don't let her down is you're going to hear some tapping of the feet. 600 years old, Noah is. And, Physical stress, the faith to believe that it is God that's calling him to do what he needs to, you know what I'm saying, courage to do what God commands you to do. Uh, the Bible talks about the time of Jacob's trouble where men's hearts are failing them for fear. Um, but Noah did all according to, let's see, also, no, remember that Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. It's not a choice, brethren. A lot of people out there will say, well, it's just your opinion. Uh, we're going to have to agree to disagree. I've had a woman that told me that the Bible is just a guide. It's not something you have to follow. It's just a guide, you know. You can follow it if you want to or you don't. Uh, no, God's command and God's word, it's not a choice, brethren. When someone comes to you with the word of God and says, Hey, you know, uh, what you're doing is wrong, and, and they quote scripture, you need to repent, and you need to... You need to Gosh, submit yourself. Sometimes I gotta punch down the words. Submit yourself to the word of God and to the Lord. Okay. We do not pick and choose what commands we wish to listen to. The lost world and fake Christians, they choose what they want to listen to. It goes back to what I was saying about the Bible. Um, Satan offers you the power of control, and that power and control is you get to be the final authority. You get to decide what's right and wrong, and you get to decide how you want to live your life and what you want to do. Nobody else is going to tell you differently. And the fake Christians say, try to deceive people into believing, I believe God's the final authority, but only through me. My opinions and what I want, not through His written word, but through me. And verse 7, And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him in the ark because of the waters and the flood. This is the part I was talking about those movies you want to stay away from them. Evidently some other old guy got snuck on, you know. Noah's kids didn't have wives at all. Verse 8, of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, as we talked about, and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto the Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. Okay. Verse 10, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah, Shem, Ham, and Jath Noah, and Shem, and Ham, and Jathus, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons, with them into the ark. They, and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort, and they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh. Why? Because you need male and female to procreate. As God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth like the catching away of the body of Christ. We're going to be lifted above all the wrath that God's going to be pouring out in the time of Jacob's trouble. I put on here, do not let anybody steal your crown. Don't let anybody keep you from looking forward to God uh, coming in the clouds and calling us home, saying, come up hither. Don't let people steal that from you, that crown of reward of looking to Jesus' coming 
to take his bride home. Okay? This is not the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's coming in the clouds. He doesn't touch down. He's coming. Are you finished? He's coming in the clouds. And uh, he's not touching down. He's calling us home. He's mad because I have the, <laughs> the uh, bird feeder right here. Verse 18, we're going to wrap this up. And the waters prevailed. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went up upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills that were under the whole heavens and, what, and were covered. The whole heavens were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the water prevail and the mountains were covered. And all the flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of life and of all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things. And of the fowl of the heavens, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth on a hundred and fifty days. So was Noah's. So in this whole study, brothers and sisters in Christ, was Noah courageous or foolish? Another part of the Bible talks about how Noah was a prophet or a priest. Um, and someone can link the verse down there. In other words, Noah was telling them what was going to happen. Noah didn't, wasn't just heartless. Noah told them the lost world, that God's going to destroy the world. And they wouldn't listen. And today, as a cur to, and to, to give courage to the brethren of Christ, you're going to have people laugh at you and mock you. Uh, you got people that just totally will personally attack you, your wife, your kids, okay? They're going to attack brothers in Christ that you care about, sisters in Christ that you care about. They are going to attack you. Why? Because they don't, they don't understand, they don't truly understand what's coming, the time of Jacob's trouble. They don't truly understand what hell's like. Okay? We can tell them all we want, but they don't have the fear of the Lord. They're not going to understand, but someday they will. But remember my study about how we need to remember to give God, oh, pardon me, to give God glory when we're being persecuted, to be counted worthy to suffer for Jesus Christ. Don't let bitterness get in your heart when people are attacking you personally. They're attacking the Word of God. They're attacking our Jesus because they love their false Jesus, their fake Jesus, which is the Antichrist. Um, don't get discouraged to the point of letting bitterness get in your heart, letting that bitterness turn into anger, and that anger to turn into hate. Don't get to the point where you're attacking those men that are attacking you. You attack the ministry. You attack the false teachings. And you do it with the scripture. Don't fall into the trap of attacking them personally. And that's also getting off a little bit on a side note. But brethren, be courageous. Stay in the habitation of a Christian. The perfect written word of God, prayer, and among brothers and sisters in Christ. We go out and preach the law to the lost world, the gospel. You don't bring the lost world in and preach the gospel. You go out to the lost world and preach the gospel. Be courageous. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.